Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Jesus forgave us of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. The first time I realized that Jesus took the absolute penalty, punishment, all of it for my sins, that was freedom for me. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach on hardness of heart. I've got a book by that title in English and in Spanish. I've got CDs and DVDs. And a week ago yesterday, I started teaching on this topic. I haven't taught on this since 2015, and yet this is one of the most foundational things that God has taught me. I know that the title puts some people off and they think, well, hard-heartedness, that's talking about people that are God-haters. That doesn't apply to me. But I've tried to establish in the first week and these seven programs that I've made, I've tried to establish that being hard-hearted means that you are cold, insensitive, unfeeling, or unyielding towards the Lord in some area. And you can love God and still have an area of your life that you are insensitive towards God, where you are more sensitive to doubt and unbelief than you are God. If that's so, it's because you have a hardened heart. And on our program last Friday, I started sharing out of Hebrews chapter 3 that that verse there in verse 13 says, uh, "...beware lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin." Sin will harden our heart towards God. And even though that's absolutely true, AND IF YOU'RE LIVING IN SIN, YOU NEED TO QUIT IT. EVEN THOUGH I BELIEVE THAT 100%, I WOULD ENCOURAGE YOU THAT SIN ISN'T THE ONLY THING THAT HARDENS YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD. AND AT THE END OF YESTERDAY'S PROGRAM, I WAS SHARING THESE VERSES FROM MARK CHAPTER 6. THIS IS WHERE I STARTED TEACHING ABOUT THIS WHOLE THING ABOUT THEIR HEART BEING HARDENED. AND IT SHOWS THAT THE DISCIPLES' HEART WAS HARDENED BECAUSE THEY WERE SHOCKED. THEY WERE so AMAZED IN THEMSELVES BEYOND MEASURE AND WONDERED WHEN THEY SAW JESUS WALK ON THE WATER, PETER WALK ON THE WATER, THE WIND STOP, THE SEA CALM, AND THEN THEY WERE TRANSLATED TO THE OTHER SIDE OF THE LAKE. THAT SHOCKED THEM. IF YOU ARE SHOCKED TO SEE THE SUPERNATURAL, IF YOU RELATE MORE TO THE NATURAL THAN YOU DO TO THE SUPERNATURAL, THEN THAT'S A CONDITION OF A HARDENED HEART. AND I'VE ALREADY TALKED ABOUT THAT. AND ON YESTERDAY'S PROGRAM, I WAS SHOWING THAT IN MARK CHAPTER 6, VERSE 52, IT SAYS THE REASON THAT THEIR HEART WAS HARDENED WAS BECAUSE OR FOR THEY CONSIDERED NOT THE MIRACLE OF THE LOAVES, FOR THEIR HEART WAS HARDENED. SO HERE, THE PROBLEM WAS THAT THEY DIDN'T CONSIDER THE SUPERNATURAL POWER OF GOD, THE MIRACLE OF THE FEEDING OF THE 5,000. AND BECAUSE THEIR MIND WASN'T STAYED UPON THAT, there, THEY WERE SHOCKED WHEN THEY SAW JESUS COME WALKING ON THE WATER. AND IT SPECIFICALLY RELATES THEIR HEART BEING HARDENED TO THE FACT THAT THEY HADN'T CONSIDERED THE MIRACLE OF THE LOAVES. THE WORD CONSIDER MEANS TO STUDY, PONDER, DELIBERATE, EXAMINE, THINK UPON. I THINK YOU COULD SAY FOCUS ON, MEDITATE ON. THEY HAD SOMETHING ELSE CAPTURE THEIR ATTENTION. AND WHAT WAS IT? WAS IT SIN? NOPE, IT WASN'T SIN. IT WAS JUST THEY WERE STRUGGLING TO STAY ALIVE. THEY WERE IN THE MIDST OF A STORM, AND THEY STARTED DRAWING ON ALL OF THE NATURAL THINGS THAT THEY KNEW. THEY WERE LOOKING TO THE NATURAL. THEY WERE JUST PREOCCUPIED WITH THE NATURAL. IT it WASN'T SIN. LET ME SAY IT THIS WAY, THAT I CAN GIVE YOU A TESTIMONY THAT I REMEMBER GOING TO MESA, ARIZONA ONE TIME, AND I WAS HOLDING A MEETING THERE, AND I FORGET ALL OF THE DETAILS, BUT IT WAS LIKE MY THIRD WEEK IN A ROW OF BEING GONE AND MINISTERING ANYWHERE FROM TWO TO THREE TIMES A DAY. I WAS HAVING THREE SERVICES A DAY ON WEEKDAYS, WEEKENDS. I'D HAVE PROBABLY TWO SERVICES. BUT FOR THREE WEEKS, I HAD BEEN MINISTERING TWO OR THREE TIMES A DAY WITHOUT A BREAK, AND IN BETWEEN THOSE MEETINGS, I'D TRAVELED FROM KANSAS CITY TO PHOENIX AND DIFFERENT PLACES, AND I MEAN, I WAS WORN OUT. AND I REMEMBER STANDING IN MESA, ARIZONA, TEACHING. I WAS TEACHING IN THE BOOK OF ROMANS. AND I REMEMBER STANDING THERE, AND I FORGET HOW MANY PEOPLE, BUT IT WASN'T A HUGE CREDIT. IT WAS MAYBE 200 OR 300 PEOPLE OR SOMETHING. AND I WAS MINISTERING TO THESE PEOPLE. AND I REMEMBER HAVING THE THOUGHT THAT, GOD, IF I WASN'T THE ONE WHO WAS PREACHING, I WOULD GET UP AND LEAVE THIS MEETING RIGHT NOW. I WAS JUST SO GIVE OUT. 
I had nothing left to give. And the reason I bring this up is to say that, you know what? I just was um, hardened. I was insensitive towards God, and it wasn't sin. I had been preaching nonstop for three days. I'd probably ministered 60 times or more in the last two or three weeks, and it wasn't sin that caused my heart to be hard. It was ministry. I had been giving out so much that I didn't have any time to take in. I HADN'T SPENT ANY TIME BEING REFRESHED WITH THE LORD. AND I HAVE SEEN THIS SAME SCENARIO PRESENT ITSELF IN MY MINISTRY NUMEROUS TIMES THAT I GET SO BUSY AND THERE'S SO MANY DECISIONS. YOU KNOW, RIGHT NOW, WE'RE IN A REALLY GOOD SPOT. WE HAD A FRIEND OF MINE, DEAN RADKE, COME IN WITH HIS TEACHING ON MAXIMUM CEO AND TEACH US HOW TO RUN THE MINISTRY DIFFERENT WHERE WE HAVE TEAMS THAT MAKE ALL OF THESE DECISIONS AND THE ANSWERS BUBBLE UP, QUESTIONS GO DOWN, ANSWERS COME UP. AND RIGHT NOW, I'M PROBABLY EXPERIENCING SOME OF THE uh, MOST FREEDOM THAT I'VE EVER HAD, EVEN THOUGH WE HAVE 650 EMPLOYEES. I'VE GOT ALL OF THESE OTHER PEOPLE WHO ARE DOING THINGS. BUT IN THE PAST, IT WAS A TOP-DOWN KIND OF LEADERSHIP, AND I HAD TO BE INVOLVED IN MAKING EVERY DECISION. AND I HAVE SEEN THIS MULTIPLE TIMES IN MY MINISTRY THAT THE MINISTRY WAS TAKING SO MUCH OF MY TIME AND MAKING DECISIONS AND and DEALING WITH THIS PROBLEM AND THIS PROBLEM AND THIS PROBLEM THAT THE MINISTRY CAN HARDEN MY HEART. I CAN BECOME SO PREOCCUPIED DEALING WITH THE minutia, ALL OF THE THINGS THAT ARE INVOLVED IN MINISTRY THAT THAT CAN HARDEN MY HEART, MAKE ME TO WHERE I'M COLD, INSENSITIVE, AND UNFEELING TOWARDS GOD BECAUSE I'M JUST DEALING WITH ALL OF THESE PROBLEMS AND ALL THESE NATURAL THINGS SO MUCH. AND MY POINT IS THAT IF BEING PREOCCUPIED WITH THE MINISTRY CAN HARDEN YOUR HEART, THINGS THAT ARE AROUND GOD, THINGS THAT ARE are GODLY, THINGS THAT NEED TO BE DONE, IF THOSE THINGS CAN HARDEN YOUR HEART, IF YOU CAN BECOME SO PREOCCUPIED WITH THAT THAT YOU BECOME INSENSITIVE TO GOD AND DON'T HAVE ANY TIME FOR GOD. WELL, THEN I CAN GUARANTEE YOU A MULTITUDE OF OTHER THINGS CAN ALSO HARDEN OUR HEARTS TOWARDS GOD. THERE'S NOTHING WRONG WITH SPORTS IN ITS PLACE, BUT THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE THAT ARE SO FANATICAL ABOUT SPORTS THAT THEY LIVE, THEY DREAM, THEY THINK THIS. THEIR FOCUS IS THERE. AND IT'S NOT SIN IF IT'S DONE IN THE PROPER CONTEXT, AND IN THE PROPER AMOUNT, BUT NONETHELESS, TO JUST GIVE YOURSELF OVER TO THAT TO WHERE YOU KNOW EVERYTHING. AND AGAIN, I'M NOT AGAINST ANYBODY DOING ANYTHING, BUT I'VE, I've TALKED TO SOME PEOPLE IN FANTASY FOOTBALL, NOTHING WRONG WITH THAT IN ITS PLACE, BUT THERE'S PEOPLE THAT THEY ARE SO FOCUSED ON THIS THAT THEIR LIFE IS CONSUMED WITH IT. DID YOU KNOW, IF, if YOU DO THAT, IT'LL HARDEN YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD. YOU KNOW, MY FAVORITE CARTOON WHEN I WAS A KID WAS WILE E. COYOTE AND THE ROAD RUNNER. AND I'VE HAD SOME PEOPLE CRITICIZE ME AND SAY, WELL, THAT WAS VIOLENT. I, YOU KNOW, YOU NEED TO GET A LIFE. If you... <laughs> IT IS TRUE THAT WILE E. COYOTE GOT BLOWN UP AND SMASHED AND FELL OFF CLIFFS AND THINGS HAPPENED TO HIM ALL THE TIME, BUT IT WAS A CARTOON. I DON'T CONSIDER IT TO BE EVIL. I DON'T THINK IT'S DETRIMENTAL. I DON'T THINK THAT THERE'S ANY DAMAGE WATCHING WILE E. COYOTE. MATTER OF FACT, I LIKE THE COYOTE, AND I'VE HAD SOME PEOPLE QUESTION ME ON THAT, TOO, SAYING, WELL, he, HE WAS A CONSTANT FAILURE. NOTHING EVER WORKED FOR HIM. BUT, YOU KNOW, THE THING THAT I LIKE IS THAT THIS GUY GETS BLOWN UP, BEAT UP, DESTROYED, SMASHED, AND EVERYTHING, AND HE'S JUST THE ETERNAL OPTIMIST. HE'S IMMEDIATELY RIGHT BACK. HE NEVER... THERE IS NO QUIT IN WILE E. COYOTE. THAT PART OF IT, I LIKE. SO ANYWAY, WHETHER YOU AGREE OR NOT, I LIKE THE CARTOON WILE E. COYOTE. I DON'T THINK IT'S SIN. BUT IF ALL I DID WAS WATCH WILE E. COYOTE AND THE ROAD RUNNER 24 HOURS A DAY OR, YOU KNOW, DURING MY WAKING HOURS, 12, 15 HOURS, IF THAT'S ALL I DID WAS JUST WATCH WILE E. COYOTE ALL OF THE TIME, IF THAT'S WHAT I FILLED MYSELF WITH, IT'S NOT SIN. GOD'S NOT GOING TO REBUKE ME AND PUNISH ME FOR IT. BUT IF THAT'S WHAT I FILL MYSELF WITH, AND THEN YOU COME TO ME FOR PRAYER AND YOU WANT ME TO RELEASE WHAT I'M FULL OF INTO YOU AND SO I LAY HANDS ON YOU AND OUT COMES MEEP MEEP, <laughs> YOU'RE GOING TO DIE. IT'S NOT SIN. GOD DOESN'T HATE ME, BUT I GUARANTEE YOU TO BE JUST OCCUPIED WITH A CARTOON OR TO be OCCUPIED WITH SPORTS OR WITH MOVIES, ENTERTAINMENT, 
or crossword puzzles, any of these things in their place, they're just fine. But if this is what occupies you and just literally dominates you, it is going to make you insensitive towards God. You need to spend time in the presence of God. You need to have your mind stayed upon God. You need to consider, study, ponder, deliberate, examine, think upon God. And if you would do that, then you would be sensitive to Him. And when you come into a situation that is beyond your ability, the supernatural wouldn't be strange to you because you've been spending time in the supernatural. You've been praying. You've been seeking the Lord. And because of it, it's, it's normal. It's natural for you to see supernatural things happen. You know, let me turn over and, and share this passage with you out of Hebrews chapter 11. This is a passage that has radically changed my life, and this is exactly the point that I'm making here about being sensitive to God, having a sensitive heart towards God. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's talking about uh, Abraham and Sarah and how that they believed God for a child in their old age. And it says in verse 15, it says, "...truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned." Now, if you're familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah, God told them to leave Ur of the Chaldees and come out, leave all of their kindred, all of their relatives, and come out, and God would give them a land. It, Abraham didn't obey God perfectly. He came out with his father for a period of time, and they dwelt in a city called Haran. And then when his father died, he finally came into the land of Canaan, but he brought his nephew Lot with him. I'm sure in some ways he felt responsible for Lot because Lot's father was dead. Lot was Abraham's nephew. He was probably doing this thinking that he helped him, but it didn't help Lot at all. Lot wound up losing his wife, his children, every possession that he had in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He would have been better off to have just left Lot and have done what God told him to do. But nonetheless, he did obey. He came out and he lived in this land of Canaan. And this is what this is, verse is talking about. And it says, truly. That means this is the truth. He, anytime that the Bible starts with saying, verily, verily, or truly, well, everything in the Bible is true. But when he starts off saying this, truly this is true, well, then that's because this is something that's going to be hard to understand. And he's just emphasizing that even though this may not seem right, it is right. Truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. For Abraham and Sarah, being mindful or, or returning back to Ur of the Chaldees would have been total disobedience to God. It would have been sin because God told them to leave that land and to leave all of their relatives and come into this land. And Abraham understood this so clearly that when he wanted to go get a wife for his son, Isaac, to marry, he didn't want Isaac to marry some of the Canaanites because he knew that someday God would be displacing all of those people and that his, his children would inherit that land. He didn't want this intermarriage so that they wouldn't have this affinity with the people of the land. He, he told his servants, you go back and you get me a wife back from this other land. And he says, uh, he told the servant, he said, God will prosper you. And the servant says, what happens if the woman won't come with me? And he says, well, then you're free of your oath, but under no circumstances, never let my son go back to Ur of the Chaldees. And so Abraham understood this message very clearly. He got the message and he never went back. And this verse says that they weren't even mindful of the country that they came out of or they would have had opportunity to have returned. For them, returning was sin. It was going against God's will. So you could say it this way, that sin is something that cannot happen unless you are mindful of things that God told you not to be mindful of. Or you could say it this way, you can't be tempted with something that you can't think upon. If they were never mindful of going back to Ur of the Chaldees, then they would never be tempted to go back. Man, I could be a great man of God if I was never tempted to do anything else. 
And see, this is where I think most people miss it. They don't understand that things that harden our heart make us insensitive to God. Sin does that, yes. If you're living in sin, quit it. But did you know that just being so preoccupied with this world and all of the things that the world has to captivate our attention, it may not be sin, but if you are considering, focusing upon those things, it will make you insensitive to God and you will be tempted to think like all of this stuff that we are focusing our attention upon. Did you know that Christians today are probably more plugged into the world system, to the unbelief, the doubt, the criticism, the ungodliness of unbelievers than any group of Christians that have ever lived? And I say that because of our communication uh, uh, technology that we have. Most people are watching me right now on a television station that is piped into your home, or you might be watching on the internet or something like that. And even though you're watching a Christian program right now, you also have huge amounts of ungodliness that's pumped into your home. And I doubt if there are very many, if any, people watching this program right now who also don't watch other things that are, that are portraying adultery, lying, stealing, homosexuality, uh, pride, arrogance, on and on. I mean, there is just a steady stream of ungodliness that flows through all of these uh, communication devices that we have today. It's like the sewage of the world flows right through our phone, through our television, through our internet connections. And the sad fact is that most Christians are plugged into that. We are seeing and beholding things that we should never see. You know, just yesterday I watched a football game. And during that football game, they showed commercials for the Super Bowl. And I guarantee you, the women that are going to be performing in that thing are ungodly. They were dressed very skimpily, and it was ungodly the way they had them pictured, the motions and the things that they're doing. And it's just, it's ungodly. And I guarantee you, if, if you see this stuff, then there is a temptation to like it. But according to this verse, that if, you ha if they had been mindful of the country they left, they would have been tempted. If they weren't mindful, then they wouldn't even be tempted. Did you know that you could stop temptation in your life if you didn't ever think things that brought that temptation to you? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Well, in likewise, unbelief. Uh, fear, temptation comes by hearing and seeing things contrary to the Word of God. If we didn't parade all of this stuff in front of us, it would limit Satan's access to us. Now, I don't believe that God wants us to live in a monastery and try and just literally be totally isolated from everything because we are the salt of the earth. And to do any good, the salt has to get out of the salt shaker. So I believe that we are supposed to be in this world, but not of this world. I certainly don't believe that we are supposed to use it for entertainment things that promote adultery and lust and sexual things and murder and killing and homosexual things. And sad to say, most Christians would never want to go commit those things, but they will watch movies that have all of those elements in it. And according to this verse, you will be tempted with what you think. If you don't think it, you'll never be tempted with it. And so one of the things that we need to do to make our hearts more sensitive to God is get to where we don't consider, study, ponder, deliberate, examine, think upon, use for entertainment things that we, we don't want, things that aren't godly. Look at it this way. If God was sitting next to you on your couch, would the Lord watch the things that you watch? Would He have joy in those kind of things? Man, I could start naming names of programs right now. I don't watch a tremendous amount of television, but the little bit that I do watch, I see commercials about things. And some of the programs... Man, I'm trying to refrain myself from calling names because for one thing, these programs will, people will be listening to this decades from now and it won't mean anything to them. But there are names of programs that it's just 
evil. It's ungodly, the things that they are promoting. They are promoting demons and worship of demons and killing and murder and, I mean, just terrible things. And yet there's Christians that will watch that and they think, well, I'm never going to do it. I just use it for entertainment. But by you exposing yourself to it, I guarantee you that you are putting a layer of insensitivity between your heart and between God. This is not the kind of thing that God would want you to keep your mind stayed upon. You can turn over to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Let me just do this and read it to you because I'm not sure I'll quote the verse uh, accurately otherwise. But in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. This tells you exactly what we're supposed to be keeping our mind stayed upon the Lord. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him, because he trusteth in him. If you want peace, keep your mind stayed upon God. Focus on things that are true and honest and just and pure, things that are lovely, things that are good, of good report, things that have virtue and praise. If we were to follow this verse... I can guarantee you the vast majority of people watching this program would have to radically change your life. We listen to news broadcasts that I guarantee you it is not the truth. It's propaganda. It's fake news. They are distorting, misrepresenting things. It's not true. And this says things on things that are true and things that are honest. There is so much dishonesty in the way that things are being represented, so much hypocrisy, and there's lust and all of these other things. And when we focus on those things, then we're tempted to have those things in our life. But you can become so pure in your focus. You can get to where your mind is stayed upon God. You just don't know how to be uh, distraught. You don't know how to be in, uh, you know, in disappointment. You don't know how to be depressed and discouraged. You don't know how to do those things because all you're doing is just focusing on the things of God. I know that there's some people watching this program and you're thinking, you just live in la-la land. This is impossible. You can't do it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is not a pipe dream. This is not just something that is impossible. God has given us spiritual weapons specifically to bring every thought into line and into captivity to the obedience to Christ. Sad thing is most Christians don't even see that as something possible. They don't see it as a positive goal and therefore they aren't even shooting for it. So very few people are even aiming at this, much less attaining unto it. But this is what God wants for our life. Welcome to the AWM Minute, a small glimpse on how your partnership with Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College is making a difference in every sphere of society. To help bring the gospel into the world of sports, Andrew has partnered with Super Bowl winning coach Tony Dungy and award winning sportscaster JB James Brown to create Beyond the Game. Through this GospelTruth.tv original production, we have given a platform for highly respected athletes, coaches, and chaplains to share their personal stories of how their faith in Jesus brought them through impossible odds to come out victorious. We want to give our audience a look inside these coaches, players, athletes, and show them what makes them tick. Thank you, friends and partners, for enabling us to share the gospel in a way the world has not yet seen. Check out Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Visit gospeltruth.tv today. Karis Bachelor Programs are equipping an army to go into the seven mountains of influence in every society. Everybody has a calling. Everybody is separated unto something. It's an awesome thing to be able to unwrap what God is waiting for us and be able to be truly equipped to be able to go into the world and not only minister, but to be effective. For more information on our bachelor programs, visit karisbiblecollege.org. 
Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I want to invite you to come to a special conference that I'm holding on April the 30th through May the 1st with Jesse Duplantis. We're calling it a Don't Limit God conference. Jesse is a visionary. I'm a visionary, and we're going to be sharing with you how God has caused us to just believe big, and we're seeing big things happen, and I know it would work for you too. It's April the 30th through May the 1st, our Don't Limit God conference. Andrew's complete series titled Hardness of Heart is available in either a CD or DVD album and a book in either English or Spanish. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get this teaching. Hardness of heart is something that just revolutionized me. It, it was a revelation that has really given direction to my life, that I try and spend as much time as possible considering, focused on the things of God, because it makes my heart sensitive to God. This will help you, so request these materials today. You can get these products as part of the Hardness of Heart package, which includes both books and your choice of either CD or DVD albums from both Hardness of Heart and How to Become a Water Walker. The Hardness of Heart package has a catalog value of $75, but you can receive all of these valuable resources for just $55. Andrew's book, Hardness of Heart, is also available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give because there's a blessing in giving. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this book to you free of charge. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today.